I am here with the wonderful Holland Taylor. Mm. I have... Um, From your mouth to God's <laughs> I have been a fan for years. Uh, I loved The Practice. It was one of my favorite I did too. That shows. was one of the greatest parts I ever was lucky enough to get. Yes, Judge Kelsen. You know, that uh, developed over years. Um, he, it was just a small part of a very telling scene with Regina King, I think. The very yes. first time I... Wow, you're on it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been and rewatching some of it now that they added it to Hulu. And, and well, David Kelly has had seen his his wife's picture, um, whatever that one fine day mm -hmm. that I played her mother in, and I had a very flirtatious scene. I mean, it, it seemed flirtatious. I wasn't flirting with with, with um, George Clooney, <laughs> and and David said that woman could give give the daughter a run for the money for George. <laughs> and so he got this idea of doing, making the judge really a sort of a sexual, uh, an active, you know, 50-ish woman who was out there. I know, one of your but first few episodes is just when you tell Dylan McDermott that you have that erotic dream about him uh, was hilarious. Yes, yeah. well I, I particularly loved the one where, oh well we won't go into detail. <laughs> I, got, I can tell you I would get scripts late at night when I'd come home. I mm -hmm. came home one night really late, and I got the script in which it, it, she has the line, I gave him the greatest blowjob <laughs> in the history of mankind. <laughs> and I read that at like 2 in the morning, and I had nobody I could call to tell. <laughs> I, this was in 1999, you understand. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to say this on national television. I finally called up a, a, an actress friend in England because she was <laughs> at least awake. To tell her I had this uh, extraordinary scene to play. They ended up changing it to fellatio, but it was still okay. pretty, pretty much out there. I, know, I mean, I, was that, I think that was around the time like they had nudity on like NYPD Blue, too. Probably. Yeah. So. Probably. But I think it was the fact that I was an older woman that, yeah. made, it, that, that made it sort of newsworthy mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. Well, it was a great role, and I love <laughs> it that show. It was, it was. Um, D and David's been very good to me with roles. Yes, that, and um, this is going to, I wasn't old enough to watch it, but. Um, <laughs> I'm the, sure I was old <laughs> enough to do it. <laughs> um, not the practice. I mean, um, I'm a big soap opera fan. Uh, oh, my God. I still watch Days of Our Lives. Only on for one year. Yes, but I watched, uh, I've seen clips of you on The Edge of Night. Oh, my God. You know, I wish I had. I guess they're still available, aren't they? You yeah. can get them somehow on YouTube or something. I watched part of a scene on YouTube today. Because, oh, yeah. are you kidding? Well, yes, I did I'll that, show it to you. I only did that for, <laughs> for one year. Yeah. And um, I, I just couldn't. I mean, I, I needed to make a living, and I took it for one year. Mm -hmm. And the po character was very popular, and they wanted to continue. But I just thought, I can't. I can only use the excuse that I needed to make some dough that year and then then I had to get off it. And that was the year. The next year was the year they started actually really paying people for doing. So okay. That was, so that was the end of that era. But the character was so evil, she was both, she died of natural causes and was murdered by her father on the same day. Yes. And that, you remember that? Yes, it was because it was, a, it was, so Edge of Night was a crime um, soap opera. Yeah. It was mostly like trials and things. Yes. And, uh, your father, it was like a mercy killing because yeah. you wanted to keep your husband and his lover apart. Oh, God. <laughs> so murder. Yeah. So the answer to that problem is clearly, well, you have to murder her, I guess. Yeah, kill yourself and frame him. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yep. yep. So yep. we're like a lot of, because you were in theater then, were yes. a lot of theater actors uh, taking oh, sure. soap opera roles back then? Oh, my God, that? yes. You know, I mean, theater has never really been a, a you know living wage. Mm -hmm. First of all, you're never in it, you know, 365 days out of the year unless you happen to be in a very long run. So it's it's not steady work, and it doesn't really pay that well. So you have to do mm -hmm. other things to. And I also made, no, I didn't. By the time I did, um, when I did Bosom and Buddies, I stopped doing. Mm -hmm. No, no, yeah, I stopped. I stopped doing commercials at some point. Okay. Uh, I just thought I I can't no matter what do that. So can't I sell stopped. yogurt or anything anymore. No. Do no. you remember like a commercial that you're really like I can't believe I did that? Um, I actually did one of those Madge ones with your fingers in the palm olive. I don't remember. Those. <laughs> <laughs> I did one of those. <laughs> if you could see my hands, you'd think how that ridiculous. Yeah. I have gardeners fingernails, but no garden. So. Mm. <laughs> um. No, I loved um, 
your theater work, um, particularly, um, I love that you did um, Anne. Oh, that was. Um, w- um, yeah. It was a, you wrote it. Yes. And you starred in it yeah. um, about Anne Richards. Yes. And I'm a big fan of her as well. That was, uh, that was really a mission. That was not a job. Okay. It was something that, I mean, I wrote that play. I started that work when I was 65. Mm-hmm. And I was possessed with the idea of doing something creative about her because I was so upset by her death, which mm-hmm. seemed very untimely. She was a very young 73. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and she was just gone in the twinkling of an eye. And she was one of those figures that I had thought would always be there mm-hmm. in my life and in America's life because I thought she was one of the greatest inspiring figures for, for America mm-hmm. we had. And... I just couldn't get over her death, and it seemed very odd to me. It was though it was personal, mm-hmm. and I, I, th- th- I had that thing happen when you are obsessed by something emotional. You want to do something creative about it, so mm-hmm. that's how that happened. And then the whole execution of the thing, I developed it in, in six, seven theaters before I got it to Broadway, mm-hmm. before we got it to Broadway, and it, it was very costly in every way to do that. And it, it was like bringing up a child. I mm-hmm. mean, it, it, it had as much meaning for me. It was the most meaningful act of my life, unquestionably. Yes, I think I think people don't uh, truly realize how expensive it is to just to do theater, and well, you know, it, well, it it can be. You think of it as such a big booming business, but that's because of like Wicked and well, things like but that. but when we were on Broadway, that was a different matter. I mean, I wasn't producing that. Bob Boyette, who was a legendary mm-hmm. Broadway producer, was the producer there, but I had to develop it in big theaters in Texas. And, you know, you, you can only make money on a theater run if it runs for a period of time. Yeah. And uh, I did short runs in Galveston, Austin, in San Antonio, mm-hmm. in Chicago at the Schubert Theater. The, I did those things before we were a Broadway production. Mm-hmm. And so we would, we would only play for 10 days or a week, the normal kind of tour period mm-hmm. of time. You, you, you cannot make a dime on that. So, I mean, the first set I had made for Anne was $125,000. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like you got to run a little while to pay that back. So, yeah. um, so that it was it was costly in that sense to develop it before Bob Boyette took it on. Mm-hmm. But it's it, she's such a huge character. It required an enormous, fabulous set. Mm-hmm. It was a big production. It couldn't. It wasn't a little black box thing that I could develop in tiny theaters mm-hmm. at all. It was something big. Yeah, I mean, such a big um, character and. Um, woman who really I feel like we revisited a lot because yeah. of Hillary Clinton and Donald yes. Trump. I yeah. mean, um, that entire <laughs> race of hers yes. where um, she was up against... Um, oh, uh, George. Yes. George W. Uh, yes. Uh, but then well, when Carl she, Rove. Yeah. She was really up against Carl Rove is who she was mm-hmm. up against because that's where he cut his teeth on the really dirty tricks of, of a campaign politics. I mean, he, he really did unbelievably shocking things behind the scenes against Ann Richards in that campaign mm-hmm. and, and advised his, his candidate, George, to always be very, very polite and gentlemanly mm-hmm. with Ann. Yes. It was very, very shrewd directions all around. <laughs> uh, and then specifically Clayton Williams, too. Oh, before you know. that. Well, yes, he, before he shot himself in the foot. Yes, with the uh, the rape comment. Ra- yes, just li- lie back and enjoy it. Yeah. You know. um, you know, rape is like weather. Rape is like weather. <laughs> just you know, sit back and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like I remember uh, Cecile, her daughter, was just talking about how um, the Hillary debates with Trump reminded yes. her so much oh. of the debates with yeah, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. There was there is one debate with George, which I just I I, it's so unpleasant. It's so it makes me so unhappy to watch it. I Mm -hmm. can't because she was so she was such a true character. She was a true public servant. Mm -hmm. She had a kind of nobility to her. And that in combination with that that wonderful, vivid, feisty persona was just unmatchable in, in history. They were too, she's so, such an attractive character, and mm-hmm. she had a hell of a temper. And I, well, I know her staff, and I know her cabinet, her kitchen cabinet, and I know her administration very, very well, as well as a lot of her very closest friends who are one and the same. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, her anger was so, her her temper was so in the service of working hard mm-hmm. that 
she was always forgiven. I mean, it was it was always understood. It was never small. She's not a small person. She was a very big person. Yeah. And you know, we filmed the we filmed the production in a live performance. Yes. And it's uh, on Broadway HD now, which is it's always available, which is really moving to me because I wanted her voice to stay. I wanted to do what part I could do mm -hmm. in keeping her voice in the American air. Well, that's fantastic. People should watch that. Because uh, I, I saw the Ann Richards documentary that oh, was on HBO. Uh, yes. Um, but I would love to see uh, oh, the it's, production now. It's on, on well, HD. Broadway HD is just like Netflix, only it's for plays. Okay. And it's the same kind of platform uh, that you subscribe to for a month or something. It's like eight bucks a month or something. And there's a lot of wonderful plays on it. I mean, it's it's the way it's the wave of the future in the sense that I think from now on every production that is successful is going to get filmed well mm -hmm. to preserve it. I mean, gone yeah, I are the days when you say, yeah. And getting the C plays all the time. Yeah. Uh, and I actually went to NYU to get my master's in playwriting. Uh, really? Yes. And do you write them? Um, yes, I do TV now out here, but uh, I do plays from time to time. Well, um, it's a wily animal <laughs> writing a play. That's how I found out about Edge of Night, actually, because I wrote something that was set in the late 70s, and I needed a soap opera, that and I one. found old clips, and that that's what I found yours on good YouTube. One to pick. <laughs> yeah. um, speaking of you know women in general, I remember when you were on the practice, you just talked about how David... Um, gave you such a great role um, yes. for an older woman. Yeah. And now seeing you in this new film, um, Gloria Bell yes, right. um, by Sebastian Le yes. Lelio, yeah. uh, who I love. Oh, um, I love. A Fantastic it. Woman was one of my favorite movies. And it deservedly won year. an Oscar. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and now Gloria Bell is yes. a sort of reimagining of Gloria, yes. an older film that he yeah. did. Yes. Uh, you're Wait, in have it. you seen that? The I have not one? seen oh, the original, and now I need definitely to. definitely see it. Quite different in tone. But okay. It's really wonderful. He's a, you know what I love about him as a filmmaker is he puts things in the frame and mm. allows your eye to find them. Mm -hmm. The clues, the important things that you're supposed to notice about what has transpired. He, it's just in the frame, and it's usually lit in such a way so that your eye will go to it, but he doesn't, like, zoom a camera in on something he mm -hmm. wants you to see. He's not that bossy a... Uh, an editor, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so the film really unfolds before you, and it, it was so effective. I saw it with an audience last night uh, at a screening, and it was a, I realized his the tempo of his films, mm -hmm. the slow revelations of behavior, you really b become very watchful. You're yes. looking for everything. It's so so affecting. Julianne Moore is so fascinating oh in that film, um, and your scenes together. You know, they're just so well, um, wonderful and nurturing. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and it's nice to see um, just two women sharing the screen like that, yeah. and how they're just allowed to exist. You know, he did that with um, a trans actress and yes. a fantastic woman, and it's just I I heard that this. Gloria Bell is a bit more comic than the original one in time. It is, it is in a way. I mm -hmm. think the script is sets up some jokes more. But mm -hmm. again, I, I think it's more, it's more really a very quiet and real story where you get to know a person without having who they are shoved at you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's he's a very relaxed storyteller in that way, which I really enjoyed. And I, the editing, like for instance, uh, the last moment when I, I probably shouldn't define it exactly, but the moment. He chose to cut to end the movie. I thought mm -hmm. was inspired uh, because it was just at the moment where she, it got yes. gone. Yes, that's all you have to see. Yes, and that's how a fantastic woman yeah. ended too. Yes. It just feels very yes, like oh, here it there is. it is. Yeah, Click. we're gone. Um, and so speaking of how um, you spoke in interviews, how mm -hmm. um, you loved that role on the practice. How I do did. you feel like time? Um, has changed sort of in Hollywood for uh, older actresses? Well, I, you know, older actresses are always slighted, and I don't know, I I mean, the wife knows, Glenn just had that awful experience of, of uh, probably everybody in the world telling her she was very likely to win that Oscar, which of course she certainly could have done, mm -hmm. but that was quite a wonderful older role. And, I, uh, you know, the, the great actresses like Judi Dench and Helen Mirren, play these roles and the films are always just huge successes. I hope Hollywood understands that it's not just older women who are out there wanting to see older women. It's everybody yes. wants to see the full range of you know human life. And Hollywood is sometimes the last to know the obvious truth, which is that you know all people are interesting. No, I mean, it's wild. I mean, uh, 
also coming out soon is Greta, this film with Isabel Huppert. And yes. it's, it's funny. Have I think you so, seen it? I have not. Someone was, uh, Richard Lawson from Vanity Fair was joking that the plot of it is like Chloe Moritz is terrified <laughs> that um, Isabel Huppert is obsessed with her. And I'm like, who wouldn't want that? <laughs> well, <I was> <laughs> say, what's know? the problem? <laughs> I would love any of those uh, <laughs> actresses to be obsessed with me. Right. Got it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's really fun seeing that you have been able to do just such a breadth of roles, you know, where it's uh, even from Two and a Half Men, you know, to yes. um, the L Word, you know, where it's just you're playing older women who are fun and yes. like real characters. Or you actually have lives. Yeah. I, I'm doing a character on Mr. Mercedes now, which is on audience TV, which mm -hmm. I do not know what the viewership is on that platform, but it's with um, Brendan Gleeson, who's one of the great actors of this world, the great mm -hmm. Irish actor. And this character, too, is an older woman who uh, is a widow, and she lives uh, on her own. And society would say, well, she's no one, you know, because what, what is she? You mm -hmm. can't quantify her. And the fact is, 100 years ago or so, I did a play on Broadway called Butley with Alan Bates. And it was about this teacher in, in uh, uh, an English university who's just come to a crossroads in his life and he just feels done. He's having a mental breakdown. And there was an article, and I was his wife, I just had one scene with him where obviously the marriage was on the rocks. And the New York Times wrote, uh, uh, this must have been 1980 or something, an article, could there be a play about Mrs. Butler mm. who had no identifiable role in life? And the answer was no that there, there couldn't be a play just about a woman. Mm -hmm. She had to have some reason for existing that, be, that had to be <coughs> connected to a man or some, or some truly rare heroic thing like, I don't know, you know, the Madame Curie. She yeah. had to either be Madame Curie or, or involved with a man that yeah. made her valuable and interesting. Yeah. Or had a and, goblin trying you know, to kill a man. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. So it had to be either epic. You couldn't just be a person who, who had... Mm -hmm. uh, a life that could be revealed. Yes. Um, you know, you are so active on Twitter. I have to ask you, are there favorite people that you follow? Like, wh who do you look forward to seeing come across your timeline? Well, I, oh, well, I like Lawrence O'Donnell, and okay. I, like, I like Clive Barnes. I follow them because I think they're both so shrewd in their, <laughs> their take on affairs of the day um, uh, is always fascinating to me. But I I just follow I just follow a lot of people a lot of show business people a lot of friends mm -hmm. and I you know I started at when I was actually on the road with Anne because it was sort of company when I was traveling mm -hmm. and then I got hooked on, I guess on seeing those favorite opinions but also I picked up a lot of news from it because whatever a lot of the people I follow were yakking about was going to be interesting to mm -hmm. me and I actually think that I should sort of stop relying on it for news the way that I did because. There's something happening in Twitter speak that is getting a little bit. Uh, it's, it's it was a lot more fun. It was. It used to be more fun than it mm -hmm. is now. And I, you know, I now most of my friends are on Instagram, which, <laughs> I, which I like because it's all about pictures. Yes. But Instagram for me so far has been hard to learn how to wrangle. Okay. Whereas I'm, I know how to do Twitter. Yeah. And um, but I'd like to get switched to Instagram because I. I, I think love I'm Instagram. A, the you favorite do? part is the stories because you can just sort of give people a quick burst yes. of something fun, and then it's gone in 24 hours. Yes, that. It, yeah, some stories you want to be gone in 24 yes. hours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, interestingly enough, I don't. I don't look at people's stories that much. But it's it is where people put up perfectly gorgeous pictures. Yes, and uh, I think that's what it's wonderful about. What's wonderful about it? Mm -hmm. And do you know Tony Baker comedy? No. He's, oh, look up when he's okay. And there's somebody I just discovered on Instagram. I'm addicted to him. He's a very funny guy. Okay. Um, he does. He posts videos, animal videos, or people videos where he does the he does the voices. Okay. And he does the con the conversation as he thinks it should be held. It's very very. Funny. <laughs> Tony Baker comedy. Tony Baker comedy. I will follow him. And um, listen, I will be remiss if asking. Reese Witherspoon has talked about Legally Blonde three is maybe happening. I ain't heard a word about it. Professor Strawwell needs to be back. Well, I told them that. I mean, actually, <laughs> uh, we share a hairdresser recently. And I, I see her once in a blue moon. I see her at award ceremonies, mm -hmm. where she's usually carrying a statue. <laughs> and, uh, 
you know, and she, I said, is it happening? When I saw her the last time, she said, it's happening. She didn't know when. I guess she's yeah. probably booked quite heavily. And uh, but when her hairdresser, Lana Vigi, was cutting my hair one day, I said, tell Reese that if I am not a Supreme Court justice by now. <laughs> but wouldn't that be great? It would be. I mean. Especially Strum, now. Right. Strama could, I mean, there's a certain a number of years to pass. She could have. She could have retired from her professorship role and, and become a full time judge and be and got appointed to the got appointed to the Supreme Court of her state at least. If I not, think I definitely not in the frickin' United States. Yes, I want Elle Woods going to the Supreme Court and trying a case in front well, of you. First of all, <laughs> how can you not have such a, a reprise of that character given that she was so influential? But also that scene, her the first scene in the courtroom, in the uh, classroom, mm -hmm. is a really. Fa I watched it not long ago. It's a really fantastic scene. It was so well directed. I still love so much about yeah. the movie. I rewatch it all I, the time. I do too. It was very Robert L um, Lud. I can't remember his name. It's Ludekic or something like that. He was a very nice, very nice, very sharp guy. And there was also a great director of photography. Robert Lukatek. Lukatek. Yeah. And there was a director of photography on that picture who was a very, very star director of photography he was wonderful yes well no, i love that picture we will start a campaign on keep it here to get you in legally ron three <laughs> yes because it needs yes, to happen do it do it do it <laughs> do it i just did the, the roger ailes picture that uh, jay roach directed and that was a lot of fun mm -hmm. i sort of played uh again there was that this play this movie is filled with a lot of um actors who are playing tiny little roles just to be part of that whole world because he's such a great director mm -hmm. jay roach and uh, Roger Ailes is going to be a very interesting figure to see. I can't, wa can't wait to see this movie. Well, good. The whole picture. So we will get you Legally Blonde 3. We will get you, we will get you an award for it, too. <laughs> no, because, no way. No listen, way. Let's I not love ask your <laughs> award speeches. I, I, uh, your Emmy speech well, is one of my favorite speeches. That was, you know, as I walked up to that <laughs> stage, I was wondering if I said that. If I said, I said, I'm literally climbing the stairs and I'm thinking, do I dare just say overnight? What if I just don't get it and I'm just like an <laughs> asshole? <laughs> you yes, because you walk up and you're like, and you raise the statue and you're like, overnight, and the audience <laughs> loves it. They, yes. There was a beat. <laughs> there was a beat. As you see it on film, you see you see this little pause, and I'm thinking, okay, just think for a second, folks. And they got it. Because <laughs> uh, I was 50-something then. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty great. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you. You're a wonderful interview. Yeah, so nice Thank to you meet very you. Very much. Lovely to meet Just, you. Just you looking great too. Like, Thank you. A Holland came in here with a vintage Chanel scarf, just <laughs> serving fashion, and that is what we love here. <laughs>